Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, listening to my colleagues from Egypt and Syria talking about what's going on in their countries actually is very interesting because there are so many similarities, not only within the revolutions themselves, but also towards the reactions that the governments have towards these revolutions. Um, I mean, for example, with the military trials, the, the same way that they're being run in Egypt, the way people are taken, picked off the streets for saying something that the government doesn't like, and then tortured, put on trial, and then put away for a long time, it's exactly the same thing that's happening in Bahrain. Uh, just similarly to Syria. In Bahrain, they've gone after doctors, they've gone after students, professors, teachers, activists, unionists, political leaders, poets, writers, journalists, you name it, they went after them. And I think one of the interesting things is that people who have a title are spoken about, but then there are so many forgotten cases as well. There are those people who you know, work in labor and so on who are never remembered, and I think that's very, very sad. Um, how do we move forward? I think with Bahrain, it's not about a military trial. I mean, sorry, it's not about foreign intervention. It's not about um, the Western government coming in and telling the Bahraini government how they should set up a new government for the people. The people of Bahrain are very capable of doing that themselves. It's about whether the governments abroad want to support human rights or not. The only thing that is needed in Bahrain is to stop the human rights violations. And we've already seen over time how much of an effect international pressure has in the Bahraini case. Um, of course, there's always interests at play. President Obama, when he came out and spoke in the beginning of the so-called Arab Spring, he said, anywhere where people come out to fight for freedom, they will find a friend in the United States of America. He forgot to mention, unless you're Saudi Arabia's neighbor. Then, not so much. Um, so since Saudi Arabia came into Bahrain in mid-March, under the title of the GCC, along with the UAE, and used the Peninsula Shield, the GCC forces, to help quell the protests in Bahrain, um, there's been very little media coverage, and there's been very little outcry about the violations taking place in Bahrain. I don't know if you guys know this, but many people I do meet with think that the revolution is over in Bahrain, that there's nothing going on, when actually, on a daily basis, Bahrain is still witnessing protests. On a daily basis, I get tens of cases of people who are injured, people who lose their eyes, people who lose different body parts, people who are severely beaten on the streets, so badly that they're not even taken to prison, they're taken straight to the hospital because they need to be treated to save their lives. Um, and that's the situation we're facing on a daily basis. But again, because of interests, because although they preach human rights and they preach freedom here in the West, they don't actually set up their standards and their reactions based on those values, unfortunately. It's based on interests. Um, what are the numbers right now? In Bahrain, we've had around 1,500 people put in prison. We believe at the center that about 90 to 95% of all those arrested in Bahrain were subjected to severe torture. And you name it, they've done it. From the age of 12, they've arrested people all the way. And the latest victim of the Bahraini government was an 87-year-old man who was beaten on the street and then died due to the beatings. Um, we've had around 2,700 people sacked from their jobs for protesting. Around 300 students kicked out from their university, many of them the smartest students in Bahrain. So people who had three point something GPAs out of four, um, who are now not able to finish their studies. Six of those students were sentenced to 15 years imprisonment for supposedly vandalizing the university. Um, the death toll right now is at around 44 people. Now of course, the numbers seem a lot smaller, especially if you're going to compare it to somewhere like Syria, for example. But if you look at it per capita, Bahrain's population is a little above half a million if you're not counting the migrant workers. And per capita, Bahrain actually has the highest amount of detainees within the Arab Spring. And Bahrain has the second highest amount of deaths per capita in the Arab Spring after Libya. So if you look at it from that perspective, it's very widespread and it's very, very serious. Um, one of the things that I think is important within these revolutions is the factor that it was about dignity and not economics. When people came out to, de to make demands in their countries, they didn't come out and say, give us more money. They said, we want our dignity back. And it's because in our region of the world, people have for too long been treated like subjects rather than citizens. I grew up in Denmark. 
um, because my father has been a human rights activist for as long as I can remember. And we grew up in political exile. And I went back to Bahrain in 2001 and I saw the difference. I saw in Bahrain, you're treated as a, you know, a fifth class citizen if you're Bahraini. You're, you're told that you don't have any rights. You work for the regime in Bahrain, not the government works for you. And the reason why I think that people are still going on strong, although it's been eight months, and although people in Bahrain feel like they've been completely abandoned by the international community, the reason why they're still going on strong, and this is the analogy I usually like to use, is that it's like when you hold someone underwater for a long time. They don't know that there's something missing. But then, if you release them for a few seconds to go above the water and take that one breath of fresh air, and you pull them back down, they will struggle for the rest of their lives just to get back to the surface again to get another breath of fresh air. And that's what happened in Bahrain. People, for a few days, felt free. They felt like they had restrained their dignity, and they felt like they were normal human beings with human rights. And they're not willing to go back to being subjects. So this is not going to go away, and if anything, it's going to get much worse. So I think with, just like the other revolutions, what is needed right now is immense, intense pressure on this government to stop human rights violations. Um, and we also need some kind of activism from people on the ground, people like you. Um, because right now, for example, with the Bahrainis, they feel like it's impossible to get support from the UK government, for example, or the US government. So they're reaching out to people like you. They're telling people like you, you, we're like you, and we're just out here demanding the things that you grew up with. 